No, Lucas has never admitted that uh, they copied a lot of Dune. I'm not saying they did. It's not just that Star Wars ripped off Dune. There are 16 points of identity between the book Dune and Star Wars. Two desert planets with giant sand monsters and oppressed tribes people, a wise man of the desert, a space empire ruled by a space emperor, with an elite army, an uprising against that empire, a powerful syndicate of space slugs, a secret religious order with supernatural powers, voice as mind control, secret parentage, a holy sister and a destined hero. And number 16 is, well, We'll get to that. It's not just that Star Wars ripped off Dune, because George Lucas also ripped off Flash Gordon, Saturday matinees, World War II movies, Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress, Isaac Asimov's Foundation Saga, to list just a few. Good artists borrow, but George Lucas steals like a boss. And that grand larceny helped to make Star Wars the one sci-fi saga to rule them all until now. The big question going into Dune Part 2 is, can Denis Villeneuve land the Ornithopter? Can the greatest director of our time repeat the things that made Part 1 a success? Can he surpass the first movie's stunning effects, design, and world building? Can he coax better performances out of his beautiful lead actors? Can Hans Zimmer build on his splendid otherworldly score? Can Denis Villeneuve make Dune Part 1 and Part 2 together a masterpiece? Just 100% unapologetic, yes. Denny Villeneuve's Dune is not just a great blockbuster hit, not just a cerebral sci-fi spectacular. It's a masterpiece of cinema, a match for any of the greatest movies ever made. To bring Frank Herbert's true vision for Dune to the screen, in Dune Part 1, Denis Villeneuve established a question. Is Paul Atreides a hero gifted with supernatural visions of the future, or a vengeful psychopath driven by psychotic delusions? Your father didn't believe in revenge. Hell, I do. Dune Part 2 continues this tension to its violent end. In Part 1, Paul's visions do not match reality. The Shani and Jamis we meet is not the Fremen of Paul's dreams. There's a shade of Shakespeare's Hamlet in Denis Villeneuve's Paul, a young prince driven to revenge by a dead father and spectral visions. And like Hamlet, it's never certain if those visions are valid or delusion. You want to control people? You tell them a messiah will come. Then they'll wait for centuries. So as Paul and Jessica exploit the myth seeded on the rackets by the Bene Gesserit, the film conveys a growing sense that their motives are not holy at all, but simple revenge and power. This uncertainty is turned political, first with the repeated choice to call the southern tribes fundamentalist, then the artillery shelling of the Fremen siege. It's an even engaged for the ground, like honorable fighter. It's hard not to see a century or more of imperialist powers bombing desert tribes from above in Stilgar's line, and the fundamentalist violence that followed. Our empathy remains with Paul because the Harkonnens, in one of the most visually terrifying sequences in cinema history, are shown as unremittingly evil, a fascist technocracy of sadistic perverts. It's a long-standing joke to speculate on the massive death toll of blowing up the Death Star, but Star Wars never pauses to question if Luke might be a delusional psychopath in the grip of fundamentalist religious mania. Blunk on these left-wing militants and blast everything within a three-mile radius with their lasers. He didn't ask for that. That's the difference between franchise entertainment and Dune, parts one and two. <laughs> 
I was 98.3% certain going in that Denny V would nail all the technicals to land June 2. But there was one thing that Denny V began in June Part 1 that I genuinely didn't know if he could land in June Part 2. And if Denny nailed that one thing, then June would be the Star Wars killer. But to understand why, we need to talk about Carl Jung. We get it. The universe is overwhelming. You're expected to govern entire planetary systems. Your spice quotas are higher than ever. And there's always another rebellion to crush. But what if there was a better way? Our integrated solutions empower business, great houses, and the imperial throne itself. From supply chain optimization to secure data transfer, we keep the machinery of civilization grinding. We are the hand that shapes trade, the blood that fuels industry, the power behind every throne. We are shown. Display your loyalty to the mercantile with 15% off at SiteFi.com using code shown. Jungian archetypes power many of the mightiest stories in modern culture. Harry Potter is an archetypal clash of the self versus the shadow. The Matrix does all the major archetypes from anima to demiurge. Don't even get me started on Game of Thrones. It's a Jungian archetype smackdown. And of course, Star Wars and Dune. Are Carl Jung's theories a scientifically verifiable map of the human unconscious? Impossible to prove. Nothing about the unconscious can ever be consciously known. But are Jungian archetypes a toolkit for epically powerful mythic storytelling? Fuck yes. That feeling you get when Neo takes off in flight, when Harry banishes Voldemort, when Luke throws down his lightsaber. That's the Jungian archetypes doing their work. Stories don't happen out there on the cinema screen. They happen in here in the infinite imagination of the self. And Jung's archetypes are the best map we have of that inner landscape. Carl Jung was already one of the world's great psychiatrists, the protege of Sigmund Freud himself, when Jung dropped out and retreated to his tower on the shore of Lake Geneva. Yes, an actual tower like an actual wizard. There, Jung spent years in active imagination, exploring the inner landscape of the collective unconscious, discovering there the archetypes of the unconscious that he would first describe in his famous Liber Novus or Red Book. It's no coincidence that Jung's Red Book shares mythic DNA with J.R.R. Tolkien as Bilbo Baggins' Red Book of Westmarch, both creators delved deep into the collective unconscious and found there the same archetypes waiting. Through the 20th and early 21st century, these archetypes have been manifested again and again in our greatest stories. The Jungian mythos is fighting to emerge into the modern world, but every attempt to date has been incomplete. Except one. I think it, it, it makes people uncomfortable, the idea that a human being can become something other than a human being, especially something mindless out of the depths. Uh, I'm very heavily imbued with Jungian psychology, so I think that we do have a sense of, of uh, the mindless animal in the depths. Jung's ideas gained a cult following worldwide. His adherents were so devout that Jung is recorded as quipping that he was glad he was Jung not a Jungian. Among Jung's followers by the 1960s were the psychologists Ralph and Irene Slattery, who in turn taught Jung's theories to the young Frank Herbert, already an obsessive writer who saw in the Jungian archetypes a toolkit for powerful storytelling. Brian Herbert in Dreamers of June, his biography of Frank Herbert, describes how his father assigned a dominant psychological role based on Jungian archetypes to each character, then squared off characters across a Jungian mandala. 
I describe these Jungian narrative techniques in more detail in my courses The Rhetoric of Story and Writing the 21st Century Myth, available to members of the Science Fiction YouTube channel. First in his early novel, The Dragon and the Sea, then in his epic Dune, Herbert built his mastery of the Jungian narrative toolkit. Dune's spellbounding power over readers is generated by the deep Jungian mythos at the heart of Frank Herbert's story. And what makes Denis Villeneuve's Dune parts 1 and 2 so powerful is that they consciously adapt the Jungian mythos created by Herbert on the page to the IMAX cinema screen. When Frank Herbert wrote the, the, the first book for him, Paul was not a hero. He was a, a dark figure. The book, book was a cautionary tale about uh, uh, messianic figures. So I tried at my best to do this adaptation closer to the initial intention of Frank Herbert. In June part one, Denis Villeneuve establishes the major Jungian archetypes. Jessica and Leto as the mother and the father, Jamis as the trickster and Shani as the anima. In Carl Jung's psychological model, these archetypes of the inner world are matched with those of the outer world, the shadow and the demiurge. Fade Ralpha is one of the most potent representations of the shadow in contemporary storytelling. He is Paul's equal but opposite match. Emperor Shaddam is a symbolically weak demiurge. He is the power that controls Paul's reality, but his power is weak and largely bluff. This is characteristic of the demiurgic archetype that rules the psyche by fear until it is confronted and integrated. I killed him because he was a man who believed in the rules of the heart. But the world is not meant to rule. In other words, your father was a weak man. The tragedy of Dune is that even in his moment of triumph, Paul has chosen the rules of power over the rules of the heart. But Denis Villeneuve keeps open the Jungian mythos of Dune Part 2. Casual audiences can leave the cinema thinking they've watched a glorious hero story, whilst the more thoughtful will be asking serious questions about glorious heroes. And number 16 is the Jungian mythos, ladies and gentlemen. Among the other early followers of Carl Jung was a little-known university professor teaching mythology. Inspired by the Jungian archetypes, Joseph Campbell made an archetypal study of myth, creating his now famous ideas of the hero's journey and the monomyth. The Hero with a Thousand Faces was used by Stanley Kubrick in the making of 2001 A Space Odyssey. With that movie's success, Campbell's theories became an open secret among Hollywood directors as the key to sci-fi storytelling. As a hotshot young director in Hollywood, George Lucas, struggling to complete the script for Star Wars A New Hope, finally rewrote the entire movie around the 17 stages of Campbell's monomyth. Ever wondered why a brand new space station has a garbage compactor with a tentacle monster? It's because this is the belly of the beast. In fact, every stage of the monomyth is directly represented in A New Hope. Dune and Star Wars are both epic and grand manifestations of the Jungian mythos. The difference is that while Herbert was an expert storyteller consciously working with the Jungian archetypes to shape Dune, Lucas had tripped over them as just one more shiny thing to steal for Star Wars. He likely didn't even know the ideas he borrowed from Campbell's monomyth originated with Carl Jung. And that ignorance would lead to decades of failed Star Wars content. It's not that George Lucas ripped off Frank Herbert. It's that George Lucas ripped off Dune to make Star Wars and then sold it to Disney, who made something more spectacular and less symbolic, more generic and less original, more entertaining and less meaningful. Great artists steal 
But Disney aren't artists at all. Disney are bureaucrats. Denny Villeneuve's Dune is the Star Wars killer. But that doesn't mean it will become what Star Wars is today. George Lucas stole some elements of Jungian psychology via Joseph Campbell to make Star Wars the ultimate entertainment franchise. A juggernaut of empty, meaningless spectacle, only really valuable for selling trinkets and toys to kids. And on that dark side of the force, it is all-powerful. It's entirely possible that, in a time when our culture is monetized by the bureaucrats of the corporate entertainment complex, that Dune will be turned into a corporate entertainment franchise, with endless <laughs> shitty sequels from subpar directors of pop videos, and a ridiculous line of toys that only the most gothic of goth kids could love. But if the artists and creators can beat the bureaucrats back, and keep Dune as art, then it's possible that Dune could be not just the Star Wars killer, but what Star Wars could never have been, the fully manifested Jungian mythos.